Yeah, uh, thanks for, this is a fantastic meeting really, uh, and thanks uh, Rashmi and Alexei, don't see him, but thanks for reaching out and, and inviting me. And, and I was asked to talk about IL-17 production by gamma delta T cells in, in systemic um, uh, JA, and I want to do that by uh, telling you how we actually came to, to, to look at these cells, uh, together with a brief background, and then discuss what I think are the major findings of our study, uh, and, and finally wrap that up um, to provide a, a, a basis for, for discussion here. So a while ago, we started a project uh, where we were looking at, at uh, serum biomarkers in, in systemic JA and try to tease apart this disease from other related entities. Uh, and um, in context with this, we received serum samples from uh, uh, patients that were seen in Cincinnati by Alexei and, and his team. Uh, and, and this was um, 12 systemic JA patients. I won't go through the details here. Uh, the one thing that I want you to note is that uh, we received serum samples of these 12 patients both during active and inactive disease. So this is paired uh, samples, and that was uh, really nice to have. And, and we looked at, um, uh, uh, together with Wilco in, in Utrecht, we looked at uh, a huge number of, of different uh, serum uh, biomarkers in these patients. This is just a very few of those, uh, sort of the, the usual suspects. And you can see that we have uh, tre tremendously elevated levels of IL-6 and IL-18, and also S100A12 uh, in these patients. We even see elevation of IL-1 by trend. Um, so they're a lot higher than the healthy controls in, in white, and, and uh, yeah, and when the patients are active, of course, uh, this gets even even more. Uh, and uh, when the patients are clinically inactive, these levels go down. We don't see that for uh, interferon gamma, which can be for reasons that uh, Fabrizio mentioned uh, yesterday. But we also don't see uh, uh, upregulation of MIC uh, in these patients, which would indicate uh, interferon signaling. But what we saw was uh, elevated levels of IL-17. Um, now, IL-17, the function of IL-17 is, of course, to protect the host, so us. Uh, uh, and it's a very powerful antibacterial, antifungal uh, cytokine. And it mainly mediates its protective function by attracting neutrophils, a very powerful neutrophil attractant. And it's kept in balance by a number of, of different factors, which is, uh, yeah, most of those, I have to say that, actually most of the knowledge on the control of IL-17 comes from the mouse, like 98%. There's very little human data to date that, that show how this is actually regulated in humans. Now, in any case, when this is out of balance, IL-17 becomes really dangerous. It's a very destructive cytokine. It drives cartilage destruction in arthritis. It has a central role in uh, psoriasis. It uh, um, promotes lesion formation, multiple sclerosis. Cancer patients that have elevated levels of IL-17 are generally said to have a poor prognosis. <clears throat> and as we're also discussing lung diseases here, in, in those diseases, it's been shown that IL-17 can drive airway uh, remodeling. Now, the cell type, the, the one cell type uh, that, that produces or is thought to be the major IL-17 producer is the TU-17 cell. TU-17 cell develops from a CD4 positive T cell uh, it's by being hit by uh, different cytokines and then down the line develops towards a cell that can produce IL-17. Uh, that takes a couple of days. Um, but the important thing is not what it, what, I, what, I, what, I want, what I want to point out is not what, the, what happens in the end. It's like the very beginning of this chain. So to initiate this whole differentiation process, we require an antigen-presenting cell. We uh, require an antigen. So this is an adaptive immune response. And uh, we discussed that, and, and Peter and Mike discussed that beautifully yesterday. Um, adaptive unity may happen or can happen in systemic JA, but it may not be something that we associate the d disease with up front. Uh, but there's another more innate may, yeah, like bypass to this uh, um, that can produce IL-17 uh, in, in huge amounts in comparably no time. Um, and this is uh, mediated by the gamma-delta T cells. And gamma-delta T cells need comparably little to produce uh, huge amounts of, of these cytokines. Um, you need a trigger. This can be a PAMP, like a pathogen-associated molecular pattern, or a DAMP. Uh, which uh, is a damage-associated molecular, molecular pattern when you have cells that 
uh, go in necrosis, for instance, these factors are being released, and the S100 proteins that are floating around in systemic JA patients and microgram per mil uh, levels are such dams. <clears throat> so this is, can be the triggers. Uh, then uh, you can have a uh, uh, gamma delta TCR ligand, um, and this is, uh, this is th these are phosphoantigens, and, and one of these phosphoantigens is isopentanyl pyrophosphate, in short IPP, and this is a really interesting molecule, because this is produced by bacteria, but it's also produced by our cells. This is an intermediate product uh, of a <clears throat> biosynthesis pathway, and it can accumulate in cells uh, upon stress, like inflammatory stress or um, infections. So this is an endogenous molecule. Now, when you have such a trigger, like a PAMP or a DAMP, and, and that activates myelid cells, the myelid cells starts to produce uh, inflammatory cytokines, uh, and you have a, a gamma-delta TCR ligand, and that all comes together and can prime the cells to produce IL-17, and IL-17 then recruits neutrophils and can fire up autoinflammation. <clears throat> and because this all happens pretty fast and leads to production of a lot of IL-17, it may be fair to call these cells, like Bruno and colleagues did here in the Nature Analogy Review, to call these cells kickstarters of inflammation. Not the kickstarters, but kickstarters. Now, considering this, we went back to our patients and... Um, <laughs> We had uh, we, we we acquired whole blood samples from um, uh, five patients with active uh, systemic JAA and ten patients with inactive disease. Mm, we were not able to do that in the nice way like uh, Alexei collected the serum samples to really have the samples paired. Um, and uh, we had a very dedicated uh, medical student uh, back uh, then, and uh, she. Uh, would come in any time uh, a patient was, would be seen in our outpatient clinic, collect the, the peripheral blood, and then perform all the staining and stimulation procedures in whole blood, uh, and um, prepare the sample for fax analysis. And with each sample uh, that she prepared from a patient, she would also prepare a control. And uh, we acquired quite some data, and I think this is, um, to us at least, the, the most important uh, findings for, from, from our study. So what we saw was that if you looked at the CD4 positive T cells, and we looked at the intracellular uh, cytokine expression levels, not the frequencies of the cells, but the intracellular cytokine expression levels, we saw that the CD4 positive T cells revealed no changes in IL-17 expression compared to healthy controls uh, here in white. Uh, or to FMF patients, the, the grayish uh, dry, uh, triangles, which we included as sort of auto-inflammatory control uh, cohort. And when the patients are active, which is the, the red uh, boxes, there's also no change, and patients inactive in green, uh, yeah, no differences. But to our surprise, we found that if you look at the interferon gamma expression in, 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 these, in these cells, we saw that they were decreased compared uh, to our controls. And uh, now, if you look at the gamma-delta T cells, we found that these cells particularly express elevated levels of IL-17. Now, when we try to tease that apart uh, regarding the underlying uh, treatment around the time point of, of sampling, um, uh, we, we found that the CD, in the CD4-positive T cells uh, of patients that received an anti-IL-1 blockade, um, the interferon gamma levels seem to recover. Uh, and in turn, uh, the IL-17 expression by the gamma-delta T cells was going down in the patients that received an anti-IL-1 treatment. And this is not anti-IL-1 monotherapy, right? This is like, this can be together with steroids, uh, and it's not a lot of patients, but we could still see this effect. Now, what I've shown you so far is ex vivo flow analysis, and we also isolated cells uh, from patient and cultured them together with healthy donor monocytes and the triggers that I mentioned uh, um, earlier in the uh, introduction. And we looked at the IL-17 expression by these cells um, in culture. And we could see that particularly when we include these triggering stimuli like uh, LPS, like a PAMP or S100 A12 as a DAMP, as a molecule that is present in abundance in systemic JAA, the, the gamma-delta T cells from the patient start to produce a lot of IL-17. And this is completely ameliorated once we add an anti-L1 beta antibody into this system. Now, this was like a mixed patient healthy control setup, and now this is entirely healthy control. So if you take healthy control gamma-delta T cells, culture them with healthy donor monocytes, and add uh, 
recombinant cytokines like IL-18 and IL-1, you can see that particularly the combination of both is pushing the IL-17 expression by these uh, healthy donor cells. Now, this is dramatically increased once we add S100A12 in addition to these cultures. And this, again, is quenched, like seen before, uh, almost to baseline levels by canakinumab. This is the very last bar on this graph. Uh, and tocilizumab, on the other hand side, like an IL-6 receptor blocker, is not able uh, to, to do that. So this is what we think may happen uh, in, in systemic JA. So we have cronilocytes that are packed with this S100A12 protein, and, and this is set free. Mm -hmm. and stimulates uh, monocytes, TL4, dependently. And this uh, results in a, a wave of inflammatory cytokines in IL-1, IL-18, but also others. And it also generates inflammatory tissue stress, which can lead to accumulation of IPP mm, and to release of this. And this together provides a cocktail that pushes uh, gamma-delta T cells to overexpression of IL-17. The very same cocktail is not able to do that uh, for CD4-positive T cells because it lacks the antigen. But the CD4 positives may, together with the NK cells that also have an interferon uh, prediction uh, defect, contribute maybe to a uh, low interferon gamma environment that may, may further push this whole development. Importantly now, if we uh, add an NTL1 uh, beater uh, treatment here, this is enough to quench this IL-17 overexpression. <clears throat> now we thought that was very interesting. Um, but I think it's really interesting if you see it in context of these data. So we discussed that uh, uh, yesterday already. So this is the, um, the systemic JA mouse model as introduced by Patrick Matisse and, and Karen Wouters in, um, in Leuven in, in Belgium. What they did, they took a mouse and challenged that with complete steroid adjuvants or really strong inflammatory stim stimulus. And these mice uh, developed hyperinflammation. And that got worse when you put it on an interferon gamma knockout background. Mm, and the, the major pathologic finding uh, regarding the mechanism in this mouse that they made is that they found that the gamma delta T cells in these mice overexpressed IL-17. And when they add an anti-IL-17 antibody in here and treated the mice with this, uh, they could see that this could drive down the disease. So uh, this match between their data and our data is, I think, something that you don't see so often, that this is, yeah, two mechanisms that's, that, that looks so, so similar in both mouse and man. And, yeah, where do we think this, uh, this may, may play a role? Now, looking at the bigger picture of, of systemic J, and I really like this um, biphasic idea as featured by, by Peter, but also by others, and I want to refer to this here. So if we consider this, uh, that systemic JA starts with innate immune activation, overactivation. We have a lot of IL-1. We have these S100 proteins floating around IL-18 and IL-6. And this may trigger also inflammatory activation of tissue and accumulation of IPP. And this together may prime gamma-delta T cells for production of IL-17, which may then mm, yeah, operate like a bridging component uh, that links this innate and adaptive immune response that may further down the line trigger the chronic destructive arthritis. I'm not saying the gamma-delta-17 cells replace the TH17 cells, but they can rather be a linker uh, that's, that's, that's interconnecting these uh, innate and adaptive immune responses. Uh, yeah, we, we have a couple of still open questions here. So. Um, Mechanistically, I'm not really 100% satisfied yet with our findings, so because uh, the role of the S100A12 in here is 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 not yet uh, fully clear. I mean, this molecule clearly drives IL-1 and IL-18 expression, but um, we also think that there is still uh, something more to this that we want to understand. Um, we're the weird findings or striking findings regarding the uh, interfering expression by the CD4 positive T cells is something that's still puzzling us uh, and we need to better understand that. Mm, and yeah, finally, I mean, this whole discussion, which cell produces the IL-17, maybe a really academic discussion in the end, because I mean, for the patients, it may just matter there's IL-17 
and that's a problem. Uh, and we need to get, we need to control this. Um, and as our data show that the anti-L1 ther therapy can actually very well get hold of this IL-17 overexpression by the gamma delta T cells, it, it, it's probably interesting to look how IL-17 responses look in, in patients that are, um, that respond incompletely or not at all to an anti-L1 therapy. Yeah, finally, uh, a couple of people have been involved in this uh, from our lab, um, but also um, Alexei and Data from, uh, from Cincinnati and, and Wilco from Utrecht uh, for the initial uh, cytokine screening later. And I want to thank all of those and uh, our funders, uh, of course, the Research for Rare uh, um, uh, initiative in, in Germany. And yeah, I'd like to thank you uh, for your attention. Happy to take your questions. And the panel, please come up. Yeah. In Down syndromes, there's an article that I was just trying to look for about um, deficient ability to make IL-17, and I believe it's both the, um, uh, the T cell as well as the gamma delta T cell. And I'm asking that because in the talk that I'm going to give, we're going to see that 10% of the children that are classified as SJIA um, uh, and with lung disease in the series I'll present, 10% of them have Down syndrome. And if they're not able to elaborate IL-17, it doesn't mean that um, this is not uh, a part of how the SJIA-related inf inflammation goes, but it clearly couldn't, it, it, it likely doesn't um, uh, define what's happening with these children with trisomy 21. Any comment on that? Now I have the microphone, but I... <laughs> <laughs> Well, actually, uh, uh, I'm not aware of that, <coughs> to be honest. I don't know if you are or you are. No. So um, none of us is really able to answer your question, I guess. But uh, it's interesting, uh, and we take that home, I, I guess, as our homework, and we'll have a look into that. To my, so I would have a lot of questions to you all to, into the... Right. If that, if that is human data, for me it is quite difficult to understand how Down syndrome uh, and trisomy uh, 21 would link somehow with, uh, with uh, IL-17. I know that S100B and some S100 proteins are altered in, in Down syndrome uh, directly because um, of the genetic uh, disturbances. So there could be some effects on the IL-17 side, but uh, I'm not aware of, of true, let's say, gamma delta T cell or T cell deficiencies or IL-17 deficiencies in, in Down syndrome. That's the best I can say. That, that was very nice. Um, I'm wondering if you can reproduce any of the heterogeneity of SJIA by using different strains. So are there relative sensitivities to this model in different strains where gamma delta T cells have high importance in some and less importance in others? Yeah, this is a question regarding the mouse model now, right? Mm, um, I'm not aware that, um, I mean, we're talking with Patrick, uh, of course, in this, I'm not aware that they were, uh, have been trying to do that, um, to really uh, um, look into the heterogeneity of the disease and try to mimic that in, in the mouse. Um, so those are B6? This is, B, this is, this is, this is, well, there's two uh, uh, ways to do this. It's a B6 with an interferon gamma knockout, but it can also be a BALP, which is a uh, deficiency in interferon gamma. Um, so, uh, very nice talk. Um, I, you know, what I'm wondering is, you know, you, you pointed out a couple of upstream um, regulators, so IL-1 and IL-18, and, you know, I, I've <clears throat> been thinking about this idea that, um, you know, systemic JA uh, and, and MAS in that relationship may be the same sort of upstream um, 
uh, stimulators, but then a different downstream response that changes from systemic J to MAS, right? And in fact, uh, there's this notion that when patients go into an MAS-like state, maybe their arthritis is better. And that's like maybe a switch from the 17 to the gamma response. So do you guys have any data that sort of support that? I don't know if you have any MAS patients in your samples. Do you sort of see that kind of switch from the 17 to the gamma um, and then the different responsiveness of the different drugs? Yeah, I mean, we had uh, two patients um, that we could follow up longitudinally and they started with, an, with MAS and, and uh, then the MAS went away and then we can see that. I mean, we can, you can see that the interferon gamma ex ex uh, response is, of course, outrageous uh, in the beginning and you can see that going down and then you can see the IL-17 expression by the gamma delta is kicking in. So, But that was just two patients and um, it was too little to really uh, add that to that story to be of strong support. It's an, kind of an anecdotal finding, but it would go in that direction. Also a very nice talk, and uh, along the, the mouse question, have they, have Mathis and those guys looked at uh, TCR Delta knockout mice and what happens in that story? <coughs> no, they haven't. <laughs> yeah, they haven't. Uh, over here. So you, um, you chose us, or you showed us a particular cell stress mo uh, model molecule as being particularly important. And I'm curious whether you have data for that, number one, the IPP data, and, and also whether there are other cell stress model molecules that might also feed into this pathway. Um, we, these data are already published, actually. So there are two papers um, uh, by uh, Anna Badersky as one of the first authors, Journal of Immunology, uh, 2012, and then there's another Journal of Rheumatology paper. And they're, like, they have, the mm, predominantly looking JIA, <clears throat> but they also have very, f I think, a couple of SJA patients that uh, include in this study. And then they see that, particularly in the joints, you have uh, uh, clearly elevated levels of uh, this particular molecule, so IPP. Mm, which drives the expansion of the uh, local uh, gamma delta T cell sub the, sub the, sub the set in these uh, in these joints. Okay, and then the second question was: Are there other cell stress molecules that can have the same consequence? I would think so. Mm, yeah, we haven't we so haven't too. tested any in in this in, in 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 our setup. But it's yeah, it's it's a prototype, so to say. Um, but phosphoantigens are um, prototypic. Uh, molecules that activate uh, gamma delta T cell receptor, but there are other forms of gamma delta T cell receptors uh, um, sensing other um, molecules. But in a way, it is quite interesting because that is like a pattern recognition uh, system in an in a thymocyte. So it is a T, or it's a T cell because it um, originates from the thymus, but it has the capacities of an innate immune cell by sensing patterns of stress or danger. So PAMs or DAMs, and the IPP is just a, let's say, like LPS as a DAM, uh, a prototypic um, uh, activator. But there are many other uh, forms that are involved, and it has been shown in, in other models also uh, that this plays a, a tremendous role actually in organ uh, involved dysfunction, because gamma delta T cells, as you may know, they are abundant, um, uh, not so much in the circulation, but they are in the tissue. They are really abundant, so they are in the skin. They are in the lung, they are in the gut. Uh, they make up more than 50% of the T cell population in our uh, gastrointestinal system. And they are packed with IL-17. So it is really a major source. And they can respond uh, rapidly as an innate immune cell to stimulation, so to the ligand of the, of the receptor, but also to cytokine stimulation like IL-1, IL-6, for example. So really innate immune, uh, let's say, type of response of a thymocyte, so a cell bridging innate adaptive immunity perfectly. Thank you. Yeah, so thank you very much. Um, we, we have a, a study ongoing in uh, JIA two subtypes, enthesitis related and also psoriatic arthritis, uh, mainly on the notion that in adult disease we have seen IO-17 
playing a significant role in enthesitis type disease, so spondyloarthritis. But I mean, it's very clear from the evidence I'm seeing presented here, given the interplay and the change in the cytokine milieu in the kids with soldier over time in terms of their chronicity, in terms of joint disease, that if you have high expression of gamma delta T cells in the synovium and also high expression of TH17, there is definitely a potential role to target that uh, IO-17 with um, therapy that uh, does uh, work selectively on this uh, cytokine. The question is always, um, what is the right time, mm. given that um, even though you have high expression of IL-17 in the joints, what's still happening to IL-1 at the time when you have high IL-17 expression in the joint? Mm. I think DEC has a proposal that we are looking into to try and look at uh, kids who have failure or partial response to an IO-1 inhibitor who have evidence of high expression of gamma delta T cells if they could be exposed to an IO-17 antagonist to see whether that will improve their synovitis. Yes, exactly. I mean, to, to, uh, to um, elaborate on that, so the idea would be to start with patients refractory to other therapies and who, who can then be screened actually also for gamma delta T cells on for IL-17, so the mechanisms in place we, we can look into actually in them and to try to treat, to offer them and to treat uh, with IL-17 blockade, which uh, in the other forms that are now under investigation in kids with JAA is working, is working safely and, and good. So to start with refractory, refractory uh, patients um, somehow screened for that and then use that as a proof of principle and also do some immuno, of course, um, monitoring with that to show that actually with that we can reduce these responses. In the end, in the end, I'm not so sure if coming that late in refractory patients who then have the arthritic form, and we all know how difficult that is, in the end it may be that other patients, not only with arthritis, but other organ involvement may be more important actually, or this type of therapy may be more important, and it might also be that it would be more successful to, to use such a treatment earlier because, um, because in, within that whole cascade, I think that the, TA, the, the IL-17 can have a role much earlier, actually, in recruiting neutrophils, monocytes, and so on to, to inflamed tissue. So, but to start with, refractory patients, I think, would be the way to go. Can I have the microphone? This time is me. I got it. In advance. That's, me. That's tough. Can I... Can I can I play the devil's advocate here? Uh, and the question is, who comes first, the egg of the, or the chicken? Um, the, the, in, your, in your schema, which I really liked, that was very good, um, it's difficult for me to understand whether the innate signals through the gamma delta T cell receptor or through the TOL4 receptors comes before the IL-17. And whether IL-17 is actually downstream uh, to uh, compare to IL-1, uh, by looking at your data in vitro data, when you added canakinumab, it looks to me like if you neutralize IL-1 efficiently in vitro, your IL-17 production is wiped out yep. to zero. Okay, so if a patient is not responding to IL-1 and he's inhibition and he's getting enough inhibition, it is. Can I play the devil advocate? It's being very nasty. It is unlikely that there is room for a therapeutic efficacy of. Um, Inhibition of IL-17. Is that is that? A, I know it's a nasty question. I'm just I'm just asking what what is your opinion when you devised the the idea, which is very good. No, but I think you're perfectly right. But I mean, if I I mean if I understand correctly uh, uh, what you say, Fabrizio's, but you have a working IL-1 therapy, then you have no problem with IL-17, right? That's, I, I mean, mean that's basic. Extrapolating from your yeah, yeah, exactly. I mean, that's 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 exactly sure, sure. But I mean, this is exactly what I said. So, um, the interesting patients here are the ones that are completing in. Uh, I mean, have an incomplete response to, towards IL one or no response to uh, towards IL one. But it still doesn't answer your question uh, of the first part of your question. Like, where's the initial? What is the initial trigger? And I think we're all still looking for this uh, to understand this. And our data do not answer this. For sure. 
But how about how about toll four? Not, how about toll four? You're not allowed to talk. How about toll four? You mean toll four, toll four. Uh, blockade? Toll four blockade. Okay. Back to our initial idea a, a, a few years ago. Sure, could could also be applied. But at the moment, I mean, we would like to rely to what's already there, and we can block IL-17. We know that the cell population is affected by the treatment, can be reduced, and uh, so I think. So I think uh, this is the way to go. And to answer your, your first question, so of course there are many other triggers triggering IL-17 and gamma-delta T-cells. In this cocktail, I mean, IL-1 had the primary role, but there's also IL-23 and other uh, cytokines that can, that can uh, stimulate that. And also IPP, for example, or ligands for the receptor at higher concentrations can have a different signal. So I think... It's fair enough in this system, we show that IL-1 is a major driver of it, so supporting this biphasic idea maybe with the innate coming first and then other mechanisms taking over. But in vivo, then in the tissue, I think there may be a lot of other stimulants. Mm. And I think with that, time is up. <laughs> <laughs> to be continued. Okay, thank you very much. <laughs>